I'll tell you, it doesn't get much more special than that. That was really great. We really celebrate all of those uh, movements, those transitions, and so grateful. You know, as I think about that, uh, I think of my little granddaughter, who's four. Well, it's going to be a while, although she's a child prodigy for sure, like her mother. And uh, we, I was home in uh, March for a little bit, catching a few, uh, this is in Florida, catching a few uh, spring training games. And my brother uh, and his wife, and then uh, my cousin, who I hadn't seen for a while, and his wife were there too. And so kind of uh, as at the end of a long Sunday, we uh, had a dinner together at a, at a restaurant. And my granddaughter, Delaney, who uh, has uh, been, let's put it this way, uh, she has been potty trained for about uh, eight months, and uh, she did very well. A couple of times during the dinner, she had to, she asked her mother if she could leave, and she did, you know. And then um, she, for, there was a long period of time, and then all of a sudden she talked, she tapped her daddy on the shoulder and said, Daddy, would, would, would you take me? And so just as she was leaving, the room that we had, we kind of had a room to ourselves, and going toward the restroom, she said, Daddy, I have a surprise for you. We thought, oh, no. And then she, it was the blue soap in the bathroom. But as the church started, <laughs> uh, that, maybe that wasn't appropriate, I don't know. <laughs> I, I kind of questioned that. I'm not going to tell that one next hour, I'll tell you that. But... Uh, um, as I think about uh, this, I think about uh, uh, something I read this week by a, a noted pastor, and he talked about uh, the huge uh, dam that was built, the hydroelectric power, which was under construction for many years, uh, the Aswan uh, High Dam. I don't know if any of you have ever seen it. How many of you have seen that? I haven't, but some of you have. And uh, he talked about the fact that it was 375 feet high, 11,000 feet across, and Egypt's President Nasser, in 1953, uh, planned that to be built, and it was finished in 1971, and then in 1972, they had a great uh, dedicatory celebration. And the 12 turbines, uh, with their 10 billion kilowatt hour capacity, were unleashed with enough power to light every city in Egypt. Now, that was really something. During that period of construction, they allowed part of the river to continue downstream, and it was a crucial because the country folk used and depended upon the river. I mean, they drank it, they washed in it, uh, they, they spent uh, moonlight cruises on it, they, they did all kinds of things. They, it, they needed it for watering their crops. And as it was unleashed, they had no idea, no concept, of the power that was being unleashed when finally uh, the dam was in operation. Well, Pentecost, that pastor goes on to say, is much like that dedicatory opening of the Aswan High Dam. Before Pentecost, the river of God's Spirit had blessed the people of Israel and was their very life. But after Pentecost, the power of the Spirit spread out to light the whole world. None of the benefits enjoyed by the pre-Pentecostal days were taken away, but 10 billion kilowatts were added to enable the church to take the light of the gospel to the glory of Christ to every tongue and tribe and nation. Well, today, as we've been talking about, we're celebrating Pentecost when the Holy Spirit first came upon the church, that young church, that fledgling church, it was 50 days after the celebration of the Passover when God launched the church. Previously, the, the Holy Spirit had been sporadic, came upon special people, special occasions, but now the Holy Spirit came upon all believers for all occasions, continually. Beth described the actual event of Pentecost a little bit earlier that takes place, place in Acts chapter 2. This morning, we're going to look at hap what happens just previous to that as Jesus tells them about what's going to happen. He, he prepares his disciples and talks about the presence and the power of the Spirit, will, which will then give them the purpose of the Spirit coming upon them or the task. And he does this just before he ascends into heaven. 
If you would, please turn with me or watch on the screen as I read from Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. Listen now for the word of the Lord. Acts 1, 1 through 11. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand there looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. May God add his blessing, understanding, and his application upon this, the reading of God's holy and inspired word. Please join me now in prayer. God, it's so good to be here today. Thank you for the enthusiasm and the joy of this service. I pray now that in a way that's far beyond my doing, that your spirit might speak to us, that your spirit might be the go-between. Speak to the people and the preacher alike. It's in the name of Jesus that I pray. Amen. Jesus' disciples were to wait for the promised presence of the Holy Spirit. Now, Luke, the author of Acts, was also the author of uh, the Gospel of Luke, of course, and he's writing once again to Theophilus. We don't know exactly who Theophilus was, probably by his name. He was some kind of Greek official. Now, he's quick to review the last part of his first volume, the Gospel of Luke, as he talks about Jesus' suffering and as he talks about Jesus' resurrection, and then he tells about his post-resurrection appearances over a 40-day period. Then Luke writes that on one of those occasions when Jesus had appeared to and was eating with his disciples, he tells them to wait for the promise of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Just as was true for us when we're in a season of waiting, it must have been difficult for them to wait. John had baptized them with water and cleansing of cleansing and repentance, and in a few days they would be baptized or submersed or inundated with the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine what it would have been like to have to wait? Certainly, in this instantaneous world in which we're living, we hate to wait. I mean, I don't know about you, but don't like to wait in traffic, don't like to wait for a restaurant, don't like to wait uh, in all kinds of places. For example, in lines or queues when you're, you're going to a sporting event or, or some kind of a, a concert. We don't like to wait. Yet waiting can be helpful and it can be healthy. It gives us a chance to process things, and that was true for them. It gives us a chance to evaluate and to look at our resources. Sometimes it gives us some much needed rest when we're waiting. John Milton, an ode to his blindness, blindness said, they also serve who only stand and wait. A modern-day person said, the holding patterns of life are among the most fertile. While we already have the presence of the Holy Spirit in each of our lives today, unlike what they had at that time, the Holy Spirit produces within us, while we're waiting, the fruit of patience and the fruit of peace. The Holy Spirit brings his discernment and his direction, his guidance, for the time coming when we need to take action. As a church family, you've been waiting 
for the last two years for God's guidance and direction in naming the candidate who's going to be your next pastor. <laughs> it's given us plenty of time to work through some crucial and necessary issues, but wow, two years! That's a long time to wait in our terms, isn't it? I'm in a season of waiting. A week from tomorrow, I will fly to Philadelphia and interview with the church there. Maybe my last, uh, that's what I said when I started this one, but um, <laughs> maybe my last uh, interim, uh, as I've said before, I've failed retirement. But um, it's in that same kind of understandable anticipation that the disciples are wondering what's going to happen next. I mean, on Palm Sunday, they thought Jesus was going to set up the kingdom as had been predicted. After his resurrection, now's the time. He's going to set up the kingdom. And now it's 40 days after the resurrection. He's appeared to them several times, but he's been in and out. He hasn't been with them continually. And so they're wondering, when is he going to set up this kingdom he's been talking about? In a gently assertive way, as Jesus often did, and he understood them. He says, no one knows the times or the dates but our Father who has set them by his authority. And then he talks about there's kind of a difference between chronos and kairos here. Chronos is the orderly measurement of our seconds, our minutes, our, our weeks, our days, that kind of thing. But kairos is the other Greek word that's used here, and it has the idea of the time of fulfillment, God's time, God's special time, kingdom standard time. He says, God was in charge, is in charge, and we have to leave that to him, but until that time, we wait. So it is with us as a church and as individuals. Next, Jesus, disciples are told that they will receive power when the Spirit has come upon them. Now, the word for power here is dunamis, which is the same word from which we get the word dynamite. They felt so powerless to accomplish any kind of ministry during this season. I mean, <laughs> they knew what had happened to Jesus when he talked about the kingdom. And if they started talking about the kingdom and trying to live out the kingdom in any shape or form, the same thing could happen to them. Even though they'd come face to face with the risen Lord, their lives seemed terribly out of control. Oh, they were looking for that supernatural power that he was promising. It sounded very good. This power wouldn't come as a result of their doing something or their being something. It would come as the Holy Spirit indwelt them, as a gift from God. Unlike the sporadic presence of the Spirit in the Old Testament, this would be a constant power for all the days and all the situations of their lives. They felt empowered when Jesus was with them. I know, you know how you feel when there's someone that that, that, that makes a difference in your life and you're with them. You feel power with them. But he wasn't with them continually, and he kept talking about leaving them. It must have been easy to have doubts and be confused about how that kingdom was going to play its way out. After Pentecost, they had the power to do what otherwise seemed impossible, like the Aswan Dam for the people of Egypt. It was a power beyond their wildest imagination. Are you feeling weak today? Are you feeling powerless? Are you feeling like, whether you like it or not, your life is out of control? Please know this. With the presence of the indwelling Spirit, you and I have the greatest power that's ever been unleashed on this world. And I do not say that lightly. I mean that wholeheartedly. In fact, there's a sense that we have the capability of doing everything and maybe even more than those first disciples. And that brings us to our final point. With that continual presence and power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus' disciples had a purpose, a purpose of being witnesses to their world. Again, listen to their purpose statement. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. Now, the word witness here is the word martus, and it's the same word as the word martyr. A martyr is one who gives his or her life for a cause 
or to make a statement about what that person really believes. A witness is one who bears testimony telling what that person has experienced, telling other people. To be witnesses for Christ in the power of the Spirit simply means sharing with others what we have experienced and what we know to be true. I like so much the story that I read this week about a little guy who was having his tonsils taken out. It was told by his mother, Tina Blessed. And uh, his doctor comes in. I'm sure it must have been a pediatric ward. And his doctor comes in, and he has frogs all over his hat, you know, and the kid really likes the frogs. And he, he says he does. And, and, uh, he, and then he says, uh, just as uh, the, this, it was an anesthesiologist, he'd made sure that the tube was in and, and that uh, the beginning medication was going in. And, and, uh, and he, as the doctor starts to walk out the door, he says, hey, wait. The doctor turned around. And he says, yeah, buddy, what do you need? He says, do you go to church? No, the doctor admitted. Uh, I, I, I know I probably should, but I don't. Then the little boy says, well, are you saved? <laughs> Chuckling nervously, the doctor said, uh, a note, but after talking to you, maybe it's something I should consider. Pleased with that response, Austin answered, the, the little boy answered, well, you should, because Jesus is great. I'm sure he is, little guy, <laughs> the doctor said, and quickly made his exit. When the surgery was ended, the anesthesiologist came to the waiting room to talk with his mother. He told her that surgery went well and then said, Mrs. Blessed, I don't usually come down, and, and anesthesiologists don't, and talk to the parents after a surgery, but I just had to tell you what your son did. Oh, boy, she thought. What did the little rascal do now? The doctor explained that he just put the mask on the little boy when the boy signaled that he needed to say something. And the doctor removed the mask. He blurted, wait a minute, we have to pray. The doctor told him to go ahead, and, and he prayed. Dear Lord, please let all the doctors and nurses have a good day. And Jesus, please let the doctor with the frog hat get saved and start going to church. Amen. <laughs> the doctor admitted that he had been touched. This had really touched him. I was so sure that he would pray for that the surgery went well, he explained. He didn't even mention the surgery. He prayed for me. I had to come down and let you know what a great little guy you have. And soon after he left, a few minutes later, a nurse came to him. A nurse be, came to the, the mother before, to take her to post-op, and she had a big smile on her face as she walked to the elevator. There's something I've got to tell you, she said. Some of the other nurses and I have been witnessing and praying for that doctor for a long time. After your son's surgery, he tracked a few of us down to tell us about your son's prayer. He said, well, girls, you got me. If that little boy could pray for me when he was about to have surgery, then I think maybe I need this Jesus too. The most natural thing in the world the kid was doing. And that's the way it should be for us too, my friends, sharing what we've experienced. Lloyd Ogilvie, former chaplain of the Senate, said this, the dynamic power of the Holy Spirit will be given in constant flow as long as we are engaged in communicating. We are conduits or channels, not reservoirs or holding tanks. Our lives become dull and dreary if, as Christians if all we do is to take in inspiration from the study of the Bible, from worship and preaching, and an endless round of classes taught by stirring teachers where application is not mandated. The Holy Spirit's power is given for witness. Jesus tells them that they are to be witnesses. He tells them where they, to, where they are to start. They're to go out in concentric circles. And you know, I don't know about you, but it seems like it's easier to go a long distance away to tell someone than it is sometimes to tell the people across the back fence or people across the kitchen table. No one is beyond the reach of the Holy Spirit if we are witnesses. We cannot change and transform someone else's life, but we can witness to the work of the Holy Spirit and can allow him to use us to be a conduit of his power. On this Pentecost Sunday, let's just take a quick inventory. First, as a church, 
How are we doing in claiming the presence and power of the indwelling Spirit with the result that we're witnesses? It's easy to be critical of this or any other church when it comes to a, a subject like this. I really like what Earl Palmer, who's now a retired pastor from California, uh, what he said. He said uh, the high school band where he was uh, wasn't really very good. <laughs> and he said, but they would always try to play uh, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. And he said the result was appalling. <laughs> he said if Beethoven could have heard in his grave, he would have rolled over. But he, he was deaf, so it didn't matter. But so he, he, did, he, didn't, he didn't hear it. But he said, uh, um, but his answer about whether they should do it or not was like this. He said, that high school orchestra will give some people in that audience, and this will, this will be their only encounter with Beethoven's great Ninth Symphony. Far from perfection, it is nevertheless the only way they will hear Beethoven's message. Palmer then goes on to point out that the only way a starving, thirsty, deluded, and suffering world will ever hear the music of the gospel is through the body of Christ, arguably the worst high school orchestra sometimes ever to appear on a bandstand. If performance standards are really the most important measure, then the church is in trouble. But God is determined to trade the perfection of his solo performance for the possibility of playing improvisational jazz with us, the screechy saxophone players in the kingdom of God's ragtag big band. So we're not perfect, but that's not an excuse. We've got to share and witness anyway. Sometimes we find ourselves in situations that we could have never predicted, sometimes uh, ways that uh, we are asked to be witnesses. For example, I read this week about, uh, on November, in November 2010, a wedding party in Glen Leg, Australia, were unexpectedly called into action after the wedding ceremony. While they were posing for pictures along a very scenic ledge, a woman unrelated to the wedding fell in to the water, and she started drowning. Well, dressed in his tuxedo, the best man dove in and brought her back, and the woman uh, then... Uh, was, was brought to the shallows. And at that point, the bride, who was a trained nurse, waded into the water and started administering CPR. And by the time the, the life-saving people got there, the woman had regained consciousness. But according to the safety officials, they were lucky that the bridal party was there and that they acted quickly and got to her and got her to the shallows as soon as possible. After the daring rescue operation, the drenched, heroic best man and the bride, and you can imagine that, rejoined the wedding reception and continued with the festivities. And then they, it goes on to say, in some ways, the unusual, this unusual event serves as a great image of the calling of every local church. We're dressed up for a party, celebrating worship, but at the same time, we also prepare to dive into mission even when it's inconvenient and when it's dangerous. Worship and mission, loving God and loving others, praising and serving, these combinations aren't opposites. They form the dual nature of our calling as the church. How about us as individuals? How are we doing? There's some troubling statistics that come from David Kinneman's book, The Unchristian. Nearly Nine out of ten, that's 87% of young people say that the term judgmental accurately describes the present-day Christianity. And of the non-Christians surveyed, 84% said they personally know at least one committed Christian. Yet just 15% thought the lifestyles of those Christian follow Christ followers were significantly different from the norm. Would you fit into that description? In another survey of 2000, 2007, 82% of unchurched people said that they would be receptive to attending church if invited and escorted by a friend. Now, the key words are friend, relationship, and secondly, escorted, bringing them with them. And then they said, but, but, another study, but the, as a part of that study, only 20% of church-going Christians invited someone to church 
in that year? When was the last time you invited someone to attend with you a, a time like this when we share together? It's an important start. But holistic witnessing goes much deeper than just inviting someone to come to church. I'd like another story told by uh, Earl Palmer. In his book, The Enormous Exception, Palmer writes, there was a pre-med student at the University of California in Berkeley who became a Christian after a long journey through doubts and questions. As a student, he had been hit with a bout of the flu and a really bad case of the flu that kept him out of school for 10 days. During that critical absence from the, or, his organic chemistry class, a classmate who happened to be a Christian carefully collected all of his missed lectures and assignments. Then the Christian friend took time from his own studies to help him catch up with the rest of the class. Years later, that pre-med student, now a committed Christian, said to Palmer, you know, that's just, that just isn't done. I probably wouldn't have done it. But he gave that help to me without any fanfare or complaints. I wanted to know what made this friend of mine act the way he did. I found myself asking him if I could go with him to church. Palmer wrote, I think the best tribute that I've ever heard concerning a Christian was a tribute spoken of this student, and I love this. He says, I felt more alive when I was around this friend. I felt more alive when I was around this friend. Do people feel more alive when they're around you and me? Oh, dear friends, I pray that on this Pentecost Sunday that we as followers of Christ will claim the fact that we have the continual presence and power of the Spirit and that we are being propelled out into the world to be witnesses in all kinds of ways. How well are you doing? I want to say that afterwards, if anyone would like, there will be someone over here who would be glad to pray with you. It may not be about anything we've talked about, but it may be about something that you brought with you today, and you'd just like to pray with someone right over here at these doors. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, as we come to the end of our celebration here together on this Pentecost Sunday, we come to you thanking you for your plan, certainly far above our plan. And God, we're grateful that we don't know the times and the days. We can leave that kind of stuff up to you. But we want to be on Kingdom Standard Time. We want to be on your timetable. We want to be used by your Spirit. So God, continue to speak to us. Continue to direct us. Continue to guide us that this week, even yet today, you might use us to be positive witnesses for you in the world where we live. And help us to know that it's not going to be by our strength or our power or anything special that we do, but it's going to be by your enlivening spirit that makes people around us feel more alive because they're with us who have the enlivening spirit within us. I pray these things in the name of Jesus the Christ, the now risen and reigning Lord. Amen.